And welcome back to TIA 2014, day two of our three-day conference on the network of the future right here in Dallas, Texas. With us in the Dell TI Now studio is Jonathan King. He's vice president of cloud strategy and business development at CenturyLink. Welcome, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, Jonathan. We had, uh, well, I had the pleasure of having a uh, short, or, uh, well, short dinner with you last night. Was able to pick your brain a little bit um, about uh, your takeaways from TIA 2014. I know you've been on a couple of panels. You were on the opening panel that was introduced by uh, President Grant Seifert of TIA, and also you were on the big data and privacy panel. Real quickly before we get into this uh, short discussion, give us your takeaways from both panels. So I think the thing that's interesting is the reaction we had to both panels, both the opening and then our big data and privacy panel, is that there was a very strong interest from the audience and appreciation for these topics uh, at, uh, at this conference. I think there's phenomenal uh, attention on the network of the future and network function virtualization and software-defined networking, but there's interest in understanding both the technology and, and policy and societal considerations of big data, and we really had a great two panels in that regard with a cross-section of experts from IBM and SAP uh, on my panel, as well as um, innovative startups, uh, Guard Time and Norse, and then also Kaiser Permanente uh, represented uh, with uh, a doctor who is very active in uh, technology and policy considerations um, around big data and privacy. Now, a recent symposium uh, essay, Jonathan, that you wrote, uh, published by Stanford University, is that right? Uh, yes, Stanford Law Review Online. Uh, you said there were three paradoxes of big data. Yeah. What are those? So uh, my co-author and I, uh, Professor Neil Richards, uh, submitted that essay as part of a uh, Stanford and Future of Privacy Forum symposium that was uh, uh, last fall. And we outlined three paradoxes of big, big data, which are um, transparency, identity, a transparency paradox, an identity paradox, and a power paradox. And the transparency paradox says that we as individuals are very transparent in all of the data that we're sharing with our devices, with our lives. What we do is captured, but where that information resides is not transparent to us, and hence it's a paradox. The identity paradox is that uh, we as individuals increasingly have algorithms around us that are predicting the shows we watch or even the dates that we go on, and that we don't um, really know that um, we're being, our decisions are being made before we make the decisions. And, and there is, therein is the identity paradox. And then finally, the power paradox sort of is a sum of those other two, is that as this data is collected and held by um, uh, institutional powers uh, who are shaping our identities, you know, what, what is the, par that's a power paradox, where those entities that hold the data have increasing amounts of power. And uh, the point of our paper, was that we needed to start to think about uh, a, a societal discussion um, and, and what types of rules or norms or best practices should we have to uh, strengthen transparency, uh, be mindful of identity, and make sure that we're balancing power uh, around big data. Jonathan, I want to ask you what your, your concept of big data ethics uh, is, and is it a solution to the growing privacy issues around big data analytics? Sure. So we actually, uh, Big Data Ethics was a, uh, uh, a follow-on uh, law review article that we wrote for uh, Wake publication in Wake Forest Law Review. And we talk about four principles of Big Data Ethics. And one is privacy, um, the second is confidentiality, the third is uh, um, transparency, and the final one is again identity, which we talked about in Paradoxes. And Really what we do is go into more depth on how, um, in, as if you can step back to the industrial revolution when we were harnessing machines and energy to do things instead of our muscles, so to speak, that with um, this information revolution, we're now uh, innovating in ways that save on mental energy. And that as we, just as in the industrial revolution, we um, built all these amazing energy and transportation systems we have now, as an information society, effectively built what we called a big metadata computer. So we've built this big computer that all this data is going to. And just like we had workplace rules and we had environmental rules come out of the uh, industrial revolution, we now need to think about ethical principles and rules that we apply to the in information revolution. 
And we propose these four principles of privacy, confidentiality, transparency, and identity as a basis of rules. And in a very quick nutshell, um, we think that privacy um, is actually just one of the elements and that a better way to think about privacy in the age of big data is to think about privacy as information rules. That if we think about privacy as information rules, and we have a lot of information rules already, that we can start to think about um, rules we can apply that pr protect privacy but also unleash the benefits of all the things we see with big data. And, uh, confidentiality and transparency uh, similarly are different kinds of privacy or information rules where confidentiality is based on if you go to the doctor, if you go to your lawyer, you expect that information to be confidential. Well, we think that, that those um, principles in time should apply to relationships that you have with service providers, with others who are sharing information in trust and there should be norms established around that. And then transparency is really looking at sort of an inverse information rule where you know the, 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 the ground rules upon which information is gathered, shared, stored, and processed. Uh, and then finally, identity is again looking at what are types of things that we shouldn't be doing with algorithms. If we have all this information and we have this data, uh, should we allow algorithms, for example, to um, racially profile, to do things in, in the uh, digital world that we forbid in the analog world. And I think there's other areas like the vote and elections that we also have to think you know, carefully about what we do with big data. Um, how much should big data be allowed to um, profile the electorate or individual citizens and voters and their decision to vote? And our, the point of our article is really to raise these issues and to propose those four principles as things that can help inform policymakers and start to educate the debate. Jonathan, let's take those rules and ethics one step further and talk about any existing regulations, government regulations that our industry should be aware of uh, around big data. So I, I think the high level point there is we in the communications industry are very familiar with the FCC and with uh, recent activity around net neutrality, that's top of mind really for, for everybody. I think there's now the need to be aware of another agency, which is the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And the Federal Trade Commission really has been a leader in this space. They have um, been active with Congress and with the White House in starting to create policies to um, uh, promote things like privacy by design which is a growing best practice of how you design systems to be, have privacy built in. And uh, there's recent reports out, for example, of the FTC starting to propose um, increased attention, uh, attention around data brokers who are aggregating all this information and then selling it. And um, you know, the FTC is someone definitely to watch. Jonathan, uh, one more thing, and I, again, I took an excerpt out of, um, I don't know if it was the uh, Stanford Law Review article or not, but I'm sure you'll recognize it. Uh, you said a utopian rhetoric of big data is frequently overblown and that a less wild-eyed and more pragmatic discussion of big data would be more helpful. It isn't too much to ask sometimes for database decisions about database decision making. Can you explain that to me? So I think that we're in a formative period right now where we're before um, mass big data adoption. So a lot of this stuff is, is possible, but it's not being fully implemented by a, a wide base. But that's going to change because things move very quickly. So our point is that it, if we really take a middle approach and that um, on the one hand, not just think about all the amazing possible things we can do with this technology, but on the other hand, don't retrench and, and not take advantage of the technology. That there's a middle path and we think that that middle path should be informed by data itself. That if we start to take privacy into account and start to look at the impacts and the data of what our big data predictions are allowing, that um, that's a rich area for you know, how we should be focusing on it. And there's an excellent book uh, in regard to this called Social Physics, which was written by uh, Pentland out of the MIT uh, Media and Innovation Lab. And he talks about some of these concepts where you know, using data, we can start to get the benefits of improving things, but also be aware of the societal impacts and the need to um, recognize the inevitability of privacy and the importance of transparency. Jonathan, certainly a number of uh, tangential topics that we could talk about surrounding big data. So I'm sure we'll have you back on very soon. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's Thanks a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Jonathan.
And uh, thanks again, uh, once again, for joining us for our coverage of TIA's Network of the Future conference. The Dell TI Now studio will be streaming live throughout the conference. You can view our live stream and all of our programming at tinow.org. So long.